my talk, the challenges of installing software on HPQ systems. Uh, so I'm Santiago Lacal. Um, I'm a research computing support analyst here at Imperial College. Um, I work within the research computing service, which is part of part of central ICT. Um, this is going to be hopefully a, a light-hearted talk, half front, half confession, half sharing my experience about installing software um, throughout these past years. Uh, so I'm going to be speaking briefly about, you know, scientific software, uh, compiling software. I'm going to speak speaking about Conda and the shortfalls and issues I found working with it. Um, system package manager, I'm going to be talking about briefly about singularity and containers. Challenges related to software installations that are not really intrinsic to the software itself. Um, I'm going to be speaking briefly about high performance software and, of course, easy build and what role it plays um, and my apprehension to adopt it at first. So, challenges of installing scientific software. Um, they literally uh, threw me um, in the deep end and said, You are now completely responsible to install software a few years ago. And that was challenging. That was challenging because I didn't know how difficult it was. Uh, I was used to simple wizards, click next, or maybe uh, configure, make, make, install, that's it. Uh, but I realized that these can be very, very time consuming. Um, I'm talking hours, days, weeks. Um, sometimes requests from users to support software that's no longer actively being developed, not, not supported. Uh, you don't even know when was the last time it actually worked. Uh, so you've got to figure out, you've got to think outside the box. Um, find a, lot of, a lack of documentation. I was just uh, discussing this with Kenneth earlier. Um, you know, soft, poor software engineering practices from developers, and I'm not talking just about these things, enhancing code readability, keeping code efficiency, version control being descriptive, applying keep it simple, stupid, or just putting a readme file would help sometimes, or just explain what the software does. Um, sometimes you'd be lucky if you see an extension that actually looks familiar, and then at least it can point you in the right direction. Uh, sometimes it's, so, so that is challenging in itself. Um, and dependencies. Of course, we've got to talk about dependencies. Um, you think that this is going to be sort of a uh, a puzzle, uh, something that is a challenge, something to to look forward to, but you can get into a big mess. You can get into dependency hell. Um, you know, long chain of dependencies, conflicting dependencies, circular dependencies, um, diamond dependencies. That's my favorite one. You know, tool A or library A depends on library B and library C, but each of them depend on different versions of library D, and you can't have two versions of library D loaded at the same time. Um, and well, so NPM, I'm not going to talk about NPM and the fiasco a few years ago, but um, a few examples of just how things started. You know, you get a request to install Petsy, and then you're like, okay, I'm good to go. Let's see what I have. Uh, oh, I need Blast. All right, is it the right version? Oh, but am I going to install with GCC or Intel? Oh, this one's installed with Intel. Oh, but the user requested GCC. Okay, so I need to recompile it. Okay, but then I need to recompile, I don't know, HDF5 as well, because it's not parallel. As you can imagine, you know, you start pulling that string, going down that rabbit hole. That didn't seem like a simple software installation. It ended up being days. And that is if all those packages ended up being named and organized in a timely manner. When I actually arrived, it was, and you know, I have to half admit it still is a bit messy. You know, modules and folders having different naming uh, conventions, um, not being fully descriptive, modules being incomplete, not loading full dependencies. It's playing Russian roulette, really. <laughs> So, compiling software. There's a lot of things that I have to think about when doing that. You know, environments, modules, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, so we're, we're using Tickle still, um, or environment modules. No, environment module four seven, I think. Um, but it starts being very challenging. Um, 
there's a lot of things that you've got to think about and obviously you don't want to reinvent the wheel i the approach i had is okay i'm gonna be organized i'm gonna um try to start from scratch but you can't really do that um and clean the software stack because by the time i started doing that i wasn't actually doing changes i just decided okay what i'm going to do is just start writing down things so i started writing down, okay this uh open phone module is actually just named wrong i'm going to name it blah blah blah, blah. a couple of hours later i had 200 things written down and i decided it's just not feasible uh, it's better just to start with a new software stack uh, which i didn't do for years i said let's leave it for the next guy um <laughs> but then again it's not sustainable you know you keep in that mess you sort of uh, keep at it, but you know, how do you deal with many requests at the same time? Conda was a lifesaver in in some aspects. I mean, it supports over seven thousand five hundred packages. It's <laughs> yeah, um, it's mostly aimed towards end users and researchers, uh, not necessarily aimed towards HPC. Um, but it empowers users. So I was pushing the problem to them. You know, here is a tool you can manage your your environment. You can install your own packages, and that will reduce software uh, reduce support requests. I primarily lead the uh, user support, so for me that was amazing. In theory, pre-built binaries. So fairly quick. I, I say fairly because when um, requirements are defined very lax. This Conda solver takes quite a while to do its thing. Uh, users tend to complain this is frozen, et cetera, et cetera. And that's because they've requested 20 packages with no actually strict dependencies. You know, give me any version of R, any version of data table, any version of this, any version of that. Conda plays well with other services, Jupyter, Open On Demand. Um, a lot of software or a lot of uh, applications users tend to go straight to i want just jupiter i just want to jump on that and that's what i know that's what my supervisor has told me that's what i've seen in the latest youtube video that's what i want to do and it's got more and more wide adoption towards uh, uh software developers to have conda as sort of the default uh, method to install the software just do a conda install blah and put the repo however it has some caveats and some shortfalls that I've realized over the years. Um, can't be used for everything. Obviously, it's not a replacement for easy build or SPAC. Uh, most users, which still use Conda and is widely used uh, in our cluster, uh, is Python and R. Um, now, big environments can become very delicate. Uh, they grow very fast, especially R. I mean, that's an example there. R base and six packages, I'm going to store 247 dependencies. Imagine, you know, you add a couple of other packages more and you're already at 400 dependencies. That environment is delicate, as in, in the sense that users will just do, oh, well, I'll just do a conda update all, or I'll just update this package like R base, big, big package in that environment. And they won't realize that it will just say yes and it'll break. It'll break. I mean, hopefully it doesn't, and a lot of times it doesn't, but delicate. Increase user support requests to fix that. So in that sense, users tend to yeah run a conda update all or maybe just say yes when it said I'm going to upgrade the version of OpenSSL. Or a few years ago, conda 4.8, I think it was, there was a bug where you did conda update and it updated conda, but it didn't update Python. And then you ended up with an error. Um, it was fixed later, but there was really no fixing that. Uh, just <laughs> pretty much. Right, scri scri uh, scraping it, installing it again, and you know, uh, getting your environments from from uh, snapshots. It requires some playing around uh, to learn, and you know, these kind of quirks that that Conda has. Um, you know, being patient with it, um, maybe even using Mamba, which is a fork that maybe has a bit better. Uh, it's a bit more verbose when things fail instead of just failed or couldn't resolve dependencies. It's another snake, by the way. Um, it, in that sense, because of, the, of these quirks, it means that from user support side, you need to write a bit more, more documentation for the users, a bit of TLC, 
for those users to say, you know, if you're going to use Conda, that's fine, but you know, F, FY, these considerations. A lot of users also, especially you know, biosciences, want to install stuff that is not in Conda, and that's where you get into a situation where are you going to reinvent the wheel and create 20 Conda uh, recipes, and you know, push them up to Conda Forge or Bioconductor, Bioconda. Uh, it gets time consuming. So what do you do? Okay, you're going to say, okay, I'm going to install with Conda all the dependencies I can, and then I'll install with pip or with install packages. That's fine in theory, but it does become very tedious, very long. Um, and Conda doesn't play very well when you start mix and matching pip and install packages for Python and R. Um, I found that if you do it as a last resort, most of the time it does work, but you do have to take very, a very good care about what then you update, install packages that says, hey, I want to update all these packages. Um, other package managers, well, I've been very tempted over the years to say, well, this is a yum package there, so I can just do a yum install. The problem is a few years ago, we, we, we wanted to do a bit of um, spring cleaning and decided to thin down and give a bit of a cardio, uh, slim down our node images, particularly the login node. We had 2,000 libraries in lib64 uh, from HDF5, NetCDF, all sorts of things, which were fine initially, until we realized later that there was software that was linking against them that didn't actually define those as, as dependencies. And when we, you know, slim down the, the compute node images as well, then suddenly that library is no longer there. So it comes into a situation that you have to rebuild those NetCDF or rebuild that software. So the, the kind of approach is, if you're going to do a yum install, it could be okay, but it might, you know, it might, you might be shooting yourself in the foot uh, for future. And most importantly, um, they're not optimized. They're not optimized for the architecture. The same as um, as Conda, which I didn't say anywhere, but yeah. Containers. Um, we started using Singularity a lot um, as another tool. Um, it provides a practical solution, like it says here, to um, circulate large sort of software stacks with a lot of moving parts. Uh, particularly with groups in different uh, locations. Um, but sometimes these containers are not easy to create, especially if there's a lot of dependencies. Um, it starts, you know, it starts being very time consuming. You know, is it an, a bit of a gray area? Is it me responsible? Is it, you know, the user? Should I empower them to build it? You know, most users don't want to learn this, but they should. Uh, obviously, we're getting into, into a topic then that uh, that is common is that you know researchers don't have accounted time for learning compute learning Linux learning uh, how to use HPC systems uh, and it's not recognized by their supervisors it's not recognized by uh, grant givers so it's it's time that for them that is lost so they don't want to spend time on it uh, you actually find it really reassuring uh, really it's a really good feeling when you find a group, when you find an individual that says, you know, I want to learn, I want to be involved, I want to um, empower myself to support myself. Uh, so, um, in terms of containers, leveraging the OS package man manager within the, the, the container would be another case of, am I really giving um, high performance binaries? To, to the individual, it's just generic, so not optimized. And a lot of times, groups will want continuous support for that container, particularly if they want to maybe modify the source uh, code, or maybe they want to do a continuous update. Um, that means rebuilding the image. And that's where really we would push uh, them to, to do a little bit of training to, to, so they can manage their own container. Um, it's definitely a tool. Um, it doesn't obviously replace. Um, it doesn't replace Conda. It doesn't replace Easy Build, uh, but it's definitely there. Uh, but it's not 
what I'm getting with these two is that they should not be the first route to install software. Um, these are challenges that are not related to the software itself that I found over these past five years um, very pr prominent. One is how to manage the sheer number of requests. We get um, dozens of requests a month. Uh, we're a small, small team. To give you a bit of context, um, we have about over 2,000 nodes of compute, heterogeneous cluster. The majority of compute is uh, AMD, Epic, um, then to Milan, uh, Rome, sorry, uh, 128 cores. Uh, we got how many GPUs? 150, something like that. Yeah. Don't quote me on that. Uh, but <laughs> we're in the middle of a hardware refresh. Um, over 74,000 cores. Um, we're currently four in the team. We're hiring. Um, so we're a small team which means that managing incoming support requests is difficult. It's difficult to meet those demands. And, and that comes with, with another uh, challenge, which is setting expectations with users, with customers. Um, setting expectations to users with varying, various degrees of technical knowledge, making them understand that you know, at this level, installations are not 20 minutes. Installations can be days, weeks even. It depends how complex the stack is or you know, what solution they want. They want a VM, they want a database, they want all of these moving parts. It takes time. Um, and then we're talking about the installation, then it's the benchmarking, which is that's another top uh, area that we haven't uh, discussed yet, which is not accounted for. And normally researchers overlook completely. I'm just going to run it and, you know, YOLO. Efficiently maintain software stacks. I mean, I mentioned some of the mess we had. I mean, looking at here, this was what Star CCM at some point we decided to stop the 8.06, 8.4, and just call it by the day for whatever reason. Maybe it was probably as well. 6.6, 6.7, then suddenly 2021. And that translates then into the modules. What happens is, how do you clean that after? Because users, as you all well know, will hard code, those, hard code those names to the job script forever and ever and ever. And do you want to have the same links forever and ever and ever? So maintaining software stacks, organized, uh, planning, when are you going to upgrade the default modules? These kind of things is something that has, you know, has to be uh, in mind. And ensure the organization and standardization across the stack, the directory naming, the modules, are they done well? All this thing, doing it manually, is very daunting. It's, it's, it's just very daunting. Um, and lastly, ensure the software is optimized for each architecture. I mean, we have, like I said, heterogeneous cluster with different uh, uh, types of nodes. We want to make sure that that software is running as best as it can. As you know, HVC, are we delivering high performance software? One of the key things is, and I, I fall into this group, is I deliver a piece of software or a user asks for something and content install. It, great, it, way, it works great. So user is happy. Should I be happy? Should I be content? Or, I mean, I have another 40 requests waiting on the queue. So I'm just going to say, okay, the user is happy and then forget about it. But I should ask myself, am I actually giving him the best software there is, whatever version uh, it can? Maybe it could run faster, maybe 5%, maybe 10%. But that's considerable numbers. That is, you know, a time that to save the user, reducing the compute time and wall time, decreasing carbon footprint, saving electricity and money. This is not something we should overlook. So, con a lot of users, a lot of our users, don't get me wrong, will be happy with just the Conda install. But if there's an alternative way, why shouldn't we make a little bit of an extra effort to just say, it's going to take two days, but I'm going to have it you know, build uh, with those processor optimizations. I'm going to build it with MKL, with LAPEC. You know, I'm going to make a little bit of effort because in the long run, it's going to be better. Obviously, if the user, which happens all the time, is in a deadline and they need to run 6,000 simulations in two weeks, I'm sure that if I tell them I'm going to make it run faster, they'll be super, super happy. But that, and that's what really generally does happen. You know, they'll tell us in the last minute, 
oh, I need to run it faster. By, the, by, by then, it's too late. So this is where easy build, and the person behind me, Mr. Jörg Hefman Hausman, which really pushed that, uh, comes into play. Now, I was, like I said earlier, uh, very apprehensive at the beginning to adopt it. I have to admit, don't look at me that kind of. Same with SPAC, don't get me wrong. Why? I thought initially it's just going to add another layer of complexity. I know CMake, I know make files. I prefer fighting with that. You know, I got this really complex installation. I prefer fighting with that. But that was a misunderstanding from my part because EasyBuild is not there to help me with those complex installations, at least not in the first place. Because if there's not an easy config file already created, I'm going to have to first install it manually and figure out how to install it. And then once I do that, then sure, easy, an easy config file for prosperity and you know to share with the, with the world. But first, I would need to install it manually in any case, whether I was doing it with EasyBuild or not. Where EasyBuild is helping me is that complex installation that I did with OpenFOAM and I installed it with Intel and I got everything right. And then two days later, someone says, oh, I want GCC. And I want two versions before. And EasyBuild just says, sure, if it's available, yeah, here it is. And it will do it automatically. Uh, it will manage all the dependencies. It will take care of the standardization of the modules and, and the folders. So it does, it does quite a few things of those challenges uh, that we said earlier. And if we can just take that extra step and make sure that those you know, optimization flags are there, then we can get it optimized for uh, each architecture. So this is a little schematic, very crude, but something that uh, Jorg developed essentially is, well, we're going to use easy build. It's there, it's available. You know, can, you can compile the login nodes, you can jump on a computer node, but why don't we just get it to just automatically submit jobs, use our scheduler and push um, each job to a, a type of compute node and compile um, in that compute node. But on top of that, because we had so many issues with it, with our node images and contamination of libraries, cross contamination of libraries, we figure, okay, we're going to leverage um, singularity containers which have the bare minimal, bare minimal, uh, to the point that at the beginning we even uh, had some few issues where we needed to actually install some things. Um, we slimmed them down too much. But now it means that any easy config file that actually, or any software that actually pulls something, it's either a dependency or you shouldn't be pulling it, essentially. Uh, and it's working wonders. It's you know defined what easy config file in the software list, run it through automatic build, that's a message to PBS Pro, forget about it, and come the day later, and everything is passed, we should get a pass in those logs. And then that's it, compiled per, uh, per architecture. Then obviously in the background we'll have different uh, mount points for those um, for those software stacks in each of those um, uh, types of nodes. Now, to add to the other um, challenge that we had is how do we how do we make it even better to deal with all with uh, the level of support requests that we get of uh, software installation requests is why don't we automate it? And this is a kind of a future project. Um, essentially, what we would like is to create a form online that just lists easy config uh, version or software and version, and say, and the user can just say, I want this. You check if it's available, if it's installed already, if it's installed already, tell the user. Um, if it's not, create a ticket in whatever ticketing system we have and um, spin up um, those jobs and do that automatically, and us only get involved if there's a fail. Now that'll be wonders. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, so. Huh? Yes, say that again. So are you saying that each software is built in a separate container? Yes. Uh, one sense. No, no, no. It, 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 it can copy to the file system. 
Yeah, yeah. So it will pull the. It will obviously it will it will mount, it will mount the software stack already in house, already built for for that architecture into the container. So it actually detects, hey, we already built this. Uh, but obviously, if I'm if I'm installing in different places, uh, it's different uh, stacks. That is slimmed down. Yeah. Um, now, to give you some context on what we have gotten so far with these builds, in our old stack, and that's I've seen so far in 2013, 2,700 modules. New stack, courtesy of Mr. Sassmanhausen behind me, we already have 2,737 between our production and our development stack. We're almost there. And that has been, I mean, you can imagine how much time we spend here and how much time we spend there. Because I remember spending weeks and weeks on to install certain software. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> Any questions? Yeah? Sorry. Yeah. Um, I did the general remark of performance on 14. It's important to do so, but I think some people here overdo the thing. I've seen sometimes how ready to expect no, ready to do it. And I think it could be even a little bit faster than if you expect no hardware. So it's not it's not as straightforward. No, it's not as straightforward. <laughs> and often the reason for that is that the most low hanging fruit is not the fact of the system, but the fact that it is very or uh, the fact that it's easy to use uh, four binding all over the space, or when MPI is got uh, 104 spread out over 50,000. Yes, yes. Without thinking about it, um, uh, all these kind of things, on an order of magnitude more. A hundred percent, yes. Yeah. And, and, so and for, for Fonda in particular, it may download all MPIs Yes, yes. So the optimizations are not straightforward, and um, but it tends to be yes. It tends to be first the user go to the user, yeah. check the job script. What are they doing first? Um, are they just uh, asking for three hundred nodes when you know their program is just single core? Are they needlessly copying a twenty terabyte file to an array job and reading from the same file, you know, three thousand times? So, I mean, one, one of the recent um, examples that I have with EasyBuild, uh, which was with a colleague of mine, uh, they were helping someone doing uh, scikit-learn with Conda, uh, multi-core CPU, fair enough. It wasn't working. Uh, so they went easy build route, um, and they went down from seven minutes per iteration to 40 seconds. I mean, the case is then they did get it working multi-core with Conda, and but it still uh, warranted a difference of about 20% in favor of easy build. 20% is considerable. Yeah. Um, and it's not something that we should uh, just overlook. But yeah, I agree. The majority of 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 you, the majority of cases, it's it's yeah, it won't be the the optimizations that are are the things that are are really you know keeping the soft the 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 performance back. It's it's other factors, and a lot of times it's users. I'm sorry, but I have to say it. It's it's users doing something silly that they shouldn't be doing, or it's the application itself that is just coded terribly. Um, these terrible practices or writing thousands of times in a second or yes um, the question is what is the advantage of having different singularity containers for different architectures can't we have separate decks for x reason the same software compiled on all for each architecture so well i mean we have uh, if it, we have a same or a same container but we are we are compiling um, with the host optimizations, wherever that 
is actually running and mounting different software stacks on each, which are the ones that are compiled for each. Does that make sense? Yes. Oh, it makes sense to me, but yeah. It, has a it, is, it is one single RBT container image, and that is just being run on the different architecture, and it is detecting which architecture it is, and then basically mounts inside the container the right uh, the GPU stack, yeah. the uh, Zen 2 stack, etc., etc., et uh, and then obviously we'll use well, minus X post, minus N March, whatever yeah. the Rome one is. Yeah. Uh, and ob the obvious follow up question how do you do the detection? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I remember this. Hi, Arch. There is, the, there is in Python, there's a little program which detects the architecture, and I'm just running that. It goes back, um, Sky Lake, Rome, whatever, and then in the script, I know exactly what to do. It's not a weird LS CPU. Uh, no, it, it, it is <laughs> not a weird LS CPU. It is a piece of um, technology which I uh, used from the Easy project, just to highlight that these both projects, Easy Build and Easy, you can learn from each other. And that makes it um, really good to, to incorporate new technologies the, on new methods. The architect tool abstract, yeah. It's actually full that of attack. It used to be part of attack. <laughs> the code was in attack and they pulled it out and made it attack because, because we have. Yeah, yeah. So okay. It is, it is just to repeat what Kenneth said the arch spec tool originates from spec and then we pulled it out and enhanced it. <laughs> and uh, so, in those cases, there are plenty of containers that instead of giving a, a, a zip file, yeah. you give a, a module. Module. Yeah, so a SHPC is the name of the tool, by the same people. Uh, and it integrates with our module system. So, you, you install, uh, like, SHPC install container, whatever, mm -hmm. and you create a, a module. So, and you point it at the same place where you keep your. Uh, Uh, I recommend that, and I cannot recommend enough. Is that so they have their own repo, or does it get it from Scilabs, or what, the for the containers themselves? Uh, so they they have uh, they have a, a list of containers that they support, but you can make your own. Okay. Yeah. But I did, they have a lot of bio stuff. Yeah. Bio science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what I use a lot is the DB containers because mm. those are very optimized. Yes. Or, and they have the, the, the issue against stuff. Yeah. So with that, I can support weird versions of Circle Call without trying to control every unique specific of the I, Yeah. If you want to talk about that, please. Yeah, happy to, yeah.